friends love that man, Pastor Ross and Kathy Abraham. Continue to pray for them. They lost, they uh, buried their son Jaden recently. What a terrible wound to carry. I believe in God. Our, our denomination's in good hands. 50 years, and many of us are going to be in Carindale in July yeah. to celebrate the 50 year anniversary of a, of a wonderful story of faith, a wonderful and prolific church planning movement. So, Thank you for your trust, Pastor John and Teresa. It's always good being here with the Centre Point family. We spent some good time with the team yesterday, a couple of teaching sessions and then meals together and the generosity of your team. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, and thank you for the endorsement of the work of Christian Heritage College School of Ministries. Uh, so you always trust the guy who's more than a hundred kilometres away from his home carrying a satchel. In my satchel I have prospectuses and they've been strategically placed in the foyer. So you may want to grab one of those and uh, try and discern what God wants to do. It's going to be like a sleeper cell sitting on your lounge room table and start to speak to you. Time to prepare yourself. Time to prepare yourself. So it's great to be in a faithful environment. Wasn't that song number three an absolute banger? Fall like rain. So we're in the middle of a, of a great teaching series, and it's a bold teaching series. I really uh, admire pastors who want to take their congregation, their family, on a journey not only of fundraising, but faith raising. Yeah. And uh, it's courageous steps that they've taken. And for some of you, you feel like you're on a roller coaster. You've been strapped in and you have to hold on for the four to five weeks until it's time to come and bring our pledges and to bring our contributions. And so it is a season for the courageous and it's also a season for some of you who it's okay to be timid, who are starting to grow in the courage that God has given you. So I've been a pastor for a long time now and it's very rare for you to understand exactly at that moment what God is doing in your life in the community of faith that you are. So I love watching movies sometimes and I love watching the director's cut where they say this is what's happening in this moment. So I believe one of my roles here this morning is to be like the narrator, the director to explain, to help you discern a bit more accurately what God is doing in your hearts and minds as a family. Um, I love being in the spirit-filled stream of church. I grew up in another version of church where it was the Trinity was Father, Son, and Holy Scripture, and we believed in good food. Holy Spirit was like the weird uncle that we never spoke about. Holy Spirit's like Casper the ghost. He just moves in and moves out. And then my father made a bold decision when I was 10 years of age and moved us into the spirit-filled or the charismatic Pentecostal stream. One thing I love about our expression of our spirituality is that we no longer stuck at the bottom of the cross like dirty, filthy, rotten sinners, but our faith is placed in front of an open grave where we have a resurrection life of faith and literally God encourages us to walk and march in the Holy Spirit in unison with other believers. I love that. One of the other hallmarks of our version of faith or our spirituality is we expect God to move. Like I felt the faith in the room here, hands raised. Many of you weren't sitting there logically going, oh, is God real or not? You know him to be real because you can feel him to be real. One of the things I love about our expression of faith is that we believe the Word of God is living and active and stories from 6,000 years ago can apply to us and our lessons can be learned in June of 2024. We read the Word of God and it talks about David and Goliath. He picks up five smooth stones and when we live here on the car park on the way out, we want to go and find our five smooth stones. And this one represents death. And then this one represents there's, there's a sense that we believe that the Word of God is living and active. One of the things of the elements of our version of faith is that we really believe in this concept called encounter. We believe that we can experience and tangibly feel from time to time, or we have a knowing in our knower that God is real. So this concept of encounter, I want to quickly unpack in the context 
of this legacy series. I believe that there are five encounters that we really regularly need to be having in our walk to become more Christ-like and pursue His purposes in our lives, in the community of faith that God has placed us within. The first one is this, and there's an infographic behind me. It's often a kindness encounter. Many of us would have experienced before we even came and said yes to a relationship with Jesus Christ, we would have experienced another believer or we might have been in a dark season of our life and the kindness of God comes to another human being to us and while we're stuck in our guilt and shame, you realise that there is a God, there's a higher power out there and your heart is strangely warmed to the things of the eternal and the transcendent. That's why I love the ministry of Red Frogs. They're out there on the front lines. Many young people don't know God. In a moment of great weakness, often shame and disappointment, one of our workers will pick them up and patch them up again. And they go, why are you so kind? And they say, we love Jesus and he loves you. And you can see then God making bids for humanity. I want to draw you close. I have purpose for you. I have destiny. The next uh, allegiance I have is what I call a presence encounter. And this is particularly useful for young adults, especially those in university, where they start to get assaulted with left-wing and woke ideology. You see arguments and pretensions that try and exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And if you're not skillful with logic or apologetics, yet so many young adults can get steamrolled in our tertiary education. But you can come into a building like this, you can feel the presence of God. It's like you're in a bubble, a halo. You can't explain that God is real, but you know in your spirit that He is real. I love that. God can come around. And that's what happened in the celebration here today. I had my hands raised. I felt like I was transported to another realm. And all my problems had disappeared for about uh, 44 seconds. It was just wonderful. It was wonderful. And God does that. I know with the kindness encounter, it says in the book of Romans, it's your kindness, God, that brings us to a place of repentance. The third encounter is what I call a truth encounter. And that's what I love about the church. Preaches the word of God across this pulpit, pulpit faithfully. 52 weeks of a year, rain, hail or shine. The word of God is preached. Truth with a capital T is preached. Can you remember opening the word of God and reading it? I mean, you may be reading something you've read many times before. And it's like 40,000 volts of energy gets put to that verse and it just gets illuminated in front of you. It's like it might have music like ah, around as it's coming. You really, there's this download, this portal of heaven. And it feels like that word is speaking to you at that moment. I love that moment. But with that moment comes accountability. I now have to do something with that revelation that I'm now accountable for. I remember the time when I first heard the verse. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The key three words in that passage was the. The way, the truth, the life, which meant there was no other way. And I had to remember, I had a truth encounter with God, and I realized that He was the sole source, the director of my life, and my life had to come underneath His Lordship. Then I, there's a fourth encounter that we have on an ongoing basis, is what I call a power encounter. It's one thing to know the truth of God. It's another thing to be energized, to be able to do it and to activate it. That's why I love in Philippians 2, in 13 and 14, you read the Amplified, it says, God's Holy Spirit has been deposited within us to not only give us the desire to be like Jesus, but also the power to be like Jesus. And I love this symbiotic relationship, God in me, me and Him, and I'm in this life-giving fight where my thinking becomes His thinking. His truth is transforming me. I'm encountering His power. Many of us have been beaten up by life, often by bad decisions or choices. Some churches I have a partnership in, we're in and out of preaching, and Sunday night is their voltage service, the power of God service. And if you've been beaten up by life, if you've had a head-on smash relationally, it's like you turn up at the altar at one of our churches 
and it's like an emergency department. At that moment, you don't need truth. You don't need a cup of coffee. You need a shot of the power of God like morphine and it gives you hope to let you know that God, yes, you can deliver me from this chronic pain. But we can't live in ICU, we can't live in the ED, have to go out to the wards and do the rehab, do the hard work to be restored. This is the outgoing of encounters. Everyone would think, oh, Pastor Andrew, move on to the next slide. No, I'm going to tell you about the fifth encounter. Director's cut right now, I say, sound guy. Insert funky music right now. <laughs> this is the moment. And there comes times in our life where God's kindness, His truth, His power, His presence all converge. And there comes seasons in our life where God says, what are you going to do with the implanted word that I put inside you? And this is where Jesus says, I no longer want to be your Facebook friend in this season. I want to be your Lord and I want to be your teacher. And these, these are moments where God challenges us to the very core of our decision-making center of our life where, where normally we would say, mate, mate. Mine, like the bossy seagull trying to steal a chip down at the beach. Mine, mine. And like a two or three year old playing with toys. Mine, mine. And God says, I'd like to talk to you about that area because I see this as a blockage for you to becoming more like me and move to greater levels. This is what I call an allegiance encounter. This is the areas where words like surrender and obedience and sacrifice that's the native language of this realm and when we move and part with god and have his power to make bold decisions these are the areas of our life where transformation gets accelerated to another level it's like an area over your heart or over your will it says you've got a sticker over that says under new management yeah. this is like jesus in the garden of gethsemane he's just going through father god can we just go through the plan again I'm about to be arrested. It's going to be a lot of blood, a lot of jabbing, and then I'm going to die. And you're going to come back and get me, all right, aren't you? Let me just go through the plan one more time, Father. I'm going to die like no breath, no nothing. You're going to come back and get me, aren't you, Dad? And he goes, not my will, but yours like the song fall like rain god i want your spirit to have full control and reign in my life that's your neighbor right now says it's all right he's going to move to the next slide in a moment but these are the five encounters that god wants to cycle through our life as he become we become more and more like him let us quote from dennis kinlaw on the screen some of us see these as polar opposites but the devil's more cunning than that it says here, Satan disguises submission to himself under the ruse or the scam of personal autonomy. He never asked us to become his servants. Never once did the servant say to Eve, I want to be your master. The shift in commitment is never from Christ to evil. It is always from Christ to self. And instead of his will, self-interest now rules and what I want reigns. That is the essence of sin. The devil and the flesh always want to move us towards me, to mine, to what I want, my preference. I get to decide even matters of things that are black and white. And Jesus spoke very carefully, very kindly, but also very directly into what he determined was one of the biggest battlegrounds for allegiance of our inner making, decision making ability, the center of our will, and this is the area of finances. Now Jesus knew that a disproportionate value on finances had a big risk of stealing our hearts and stealing our affections and misdirecting our allegiances and our priorities. This is why that Jesus talked more about money than he did about heaven and hell combined, in fact twice as much. 16 out of Jesus' 38 parables deal with money. Five times more is said about money and treasure in the New Testament than about prayer. And while there are over 500 verses on prayer and faith alone in the New Testament, there are over 2,000 verses dealing with money and possessions. 
what I love about Jesus. He kindly but very directly goes to the heart and puts some resources around us. So I follow the work of Dave Ramsey, Crowd Ministries, because of my accounting background. I've, I've learned and trained myself around there in finance because, look, money's not everything, friends, but I agree with Zig Ziglar. It's right up there with oxygen on the God of Have list. So Dave Ramsey provides some wisdom, and he says up here, there are five things that you need to do to win in this era of money. There are five things that are really simple, but they're just hard to do. Number one, live on less than you make. Like I did a, a one-year contract with a multi-millionaire property developer, and his number ones, he got seven wealth creation principles. Number one was you always have to re- move in the realm of surplus. In my world, there are two people on disability pensions. One's got $82,000 in the bank, the other's got eighty-seven. It's not about how much money you have, it's learning by this principle. Easy to, easy to understand, very hard to do. Number two, stick with a written plan, for some that may include the word of budget. Number three, get out of debt, and I'm talking about unsecured credit card type debt as opposed to strategic equity building mortgage type debt. And because you don't have any payments to make on, on debt, number four, you can save and invest money and then number five, I, I encourage the people to be outrageously generous. Easy to understand, hard to do, and these principles you'll find littered uh, or strategically placed throughout the Word of God because it's um, anything to do with you changing your heart and the way you function and the way you live will always going to be an area of battleground and an area of challenge for us. I love the way that God and Holy Spirit has taught many people in this room, as he has my wife and I, how to move to new levels of stewardship and generosity based on the principles of the Word of God. Now, I said this word stewardship. Some, some people think that's a bit of an old-fashioned kind of word, but, but I'd propose those things that Dave Ramsey said, those five things, are an expression of wise or biblical stewardship. Stewardship is not a financial program. It's one of the grand narratives or one of the big ideas of the Bible that covers most of the 66 books in the Bible. A biblical worldview of stewardship can be consciously defined as this, utilizing and managing all resources that God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of his creation. The central essence of a biblical worldview stewardship is managing everything that God brings into our life in a manner that honours God and impacts eternity. Now normally, I I do a lot of teaching in this area, so I'm I'm expressing compressed, and I'm sorry I should have given you a set of notes so you can go and and, um, do this on your home, but maybe that's a chance for another time. But, But stewardship, the managing of the resources God's entrusted to us, starts and ends with this idea that God has ownership of it all. I don't have time to go through the Bible verses, but have a look at what it says King David said in 1 Chronicles 29. He said this, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. He notices five things there. He's pretty thankful, isn't he? For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honour come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, O God, we give thanks. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. There is like four verses there. Look at the writ. David, King David, known as a man after God's own heart, a man who modern day finance people would say was a multi-billionaire literally ran the whole known world at the time. He has this very clear understanding of how resource, time, talent, treasure, his sexuality, 
how all that comes from God is under him and it's only God who is empowering the goodness of the life that we live. For some of you, that might be a significant tectonic plate shifting idea this morning that God owns it all. Look at another verse. It says here, I'll pull one out of Revelation, 1 verse 8 in the message. The master declares, I am A to Z. I am the God who is, the God who was, and the God about to rise. I am sovereign strong. This idea of stewardship is part of a grand narrative. The theology layered through 66 books. I was in Malaysia recently and a, a new friend I have, Stephen Moen, over, over lunch taught me this big idea and it's called the law of divine possession. And uh, have a look at the next slide. It says this, God always reserves something for himself in this world to remind us that he owns everything. You take, for instance, the Garden of Eden. God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Everything is yours except for there's one tree that I do not want you to touch and there's one bit of fruit that I don't want you to touch. Access to everything except one thing because God always leaves this idea here. He always reserves something for himself in this world to remind us that he owns everything. Yeah. Take the idea of the Sabbath. We can work six days, but he says, I want one day reserved for myself. Of the 168 hours in a week, you can do whatever you want except for a 24-hour segment. Why? Because God reserves something for himself in this world to remind us, a little gentle nudge, like a, a nudge, that he owns everything. You take the story when the people of God entered the promised land. They walked around Jericho. That plunder was devoted to the Lord. All the other 40 or 50 cities, they could do whatever they want with it. But the first city, that's where Achan got himself into trouble. God said, one city, one city out of everything, it's just, it's just mine because that's a general reminder. Because you're going to forget that, that I, I'm keeping something for myself to remind us that he's in Lord. You, you take this. The Old Testament laws of agriculture. Six years you can plant for harvest. But there's one year I want you to leave for myself. And literally they got punished because they didn't abide by this rule. And you literally got 70 years by the seven, 490 years there in Babylon paying the price because they broke the laws of stewardship. Where God says, I want to leave you, you're going to give me one year to remind us that he owns everything. We know that there's stories and teaching in the Bible about the tithe, the 10%. 90% is everything, but I'm asking you to do one thing for me, just to remind you that I own it all. So what I've done is I've been working in this area for a while, and what I've got is a diagram up here. There's five stages of stewardship that I'd like to propose to you this morning. You could call it a steward continuum. Some of us are linear, some of us are a little bit analytical, a bit logical. We like to see a flow where God is directing and guiding us. So if you're writing notes this morning, you could put stewardship continuum. For some of you, you might write the word stewardship maturity. How am I going to grow in this grace of discipleship and how God is guiding me by the power of the Holy Spirit? Some of you might want to write the word stewardship opportunities. You see life from a opportunity of opportunity, and so this has got to be your worship maturity uh, phases, and you can see how God is wanting to guide and develop you. And this upward call, it says in Proverbs, the way of the wise winds upward. I know for me, this continuum started for an idea of feelings, where someone could get up at the front of church and they say, "Here's an opportunity to give," and it felt good in that season to do something. And so I did it. And my first steps of learning how to give as a 12-year-old teenager in my church, we were building a, a church auditorium, Garden City Christian Church, which is now Hillsong. I was a young lad and I was part of watching the journey of faith as our church. We bought bricks, one dollar a brick, back in the early 1980s. And my brother and I bought 53 bricks. And it felt good to be part of that. But the end of the continuum, now I give from a place now of trying to be as a reckless abandonment expression flowing out of a deep love and allegiance for God. One-off giving towards a 
lifestyle of extravagant giving and generosity. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to give you quick four stewardship truths and there's messages on all of that, but to cut to the chase, here's four stewardship truths I want to leave you with. Number one, God owns it all. God owns it all. Turn your neighbor right now and says, God owns it all. God owns it all. I've given you 1 Chronicles 16, right there in uh, Psalm 24, verse 1, if you like. There's a, there's a bit of biblical truth there for you. Number two, God entrusts you with some. God entrusts you with some. Number three, God gives you the freedom of how you're going to choose to use it. Now, Stuart, God, God doesn't want us to be robots. He wants us to, like good parents, we want to see our kids take the morsels of truth and, and, and we want to see them adopt it because it's wisdom and apply that into their lives and begin to build great lives because it brings us great joy as opposed to having pre-programmed robotic, robotic children that just uh, repeat road after us. That's no life. There's no sense of joy in that. Number four, God blesses me and others when I exercise good stewardship. I know this, the principle of stewardship. If you are entrusted with a small amount and you do well with that, God upgrades the level of responsibility that he gives you. So here's the continuum from first-time giver, regular givers, tithers, generous givers, and then extravagant endeavors. My wife and I have been trying to move towards the other end of the spectrum where, you know, when we sing Life song. There's a great new song out by a band, and I don't know, is it Brandon Lake or one of those Maverick City guys? One of these, they've got these collabs going at the moment. But, but I remember I went to church recently and they sung this worship song called Abandon. And, and the lyrics go this My one life endeavor is to match your surrender. My one life endeavor is to match my surrender, to mirror not my will but yours. I want completely, deeply, don't cares who sees me abandoned. It's a wonderful sentiment. And so it's what I'm proposing should drive as an act of worship, that stewardship should then lead us to a dimension of faith, and this should lead us to a dimension of uh, responsibility and blessing. Can I just say, the idea of you bringing in this season under a legacy season, bringing financial resource, your time, your talent, your treasure together in community is one of the most courageous spiritual practices that you can do. I remember as a young man being led in the churches that I've been privileged to be part of. Church leadership has led myself and my family through seasons of stewardship, faith and generosity. And I've seen the increasing measure of the kindness and the expression, the provision of God and even from time to time, financial return above and beyond what's ever imaginable or possible. I remember at the age of 14, my father sat us down one Sunday, Saturday morning, my brother and I, put a big Bible there at Concordance. He gave us one ounce. He said, boys, I want you to go through the Bible. You've got 60 minutes. Go through and see what the Bible says about your money, about our generosity. So we and my brother and I mucked around for a while, but stupid thing for Dad to do on a Saturday morning. We knew we'd get in trouble if we didn't do it, so we got going. And as I looked through the concordance and started looking up, thing, I found about this thing called the tithi. The tithi, I was thinking of the tithi. I remember looking it up and thought, this tithi seems like it's a regular occurrence through there. Dad come back, so what do you find? Dad found this thing called the tithi. He says, what's tithi mean? The 10, 10, 10 Dad. Back then, my pocket money was a dollar a week. That was a lot of money back then, can I say that? I was saving up for a bike. I just wanted a bike, it was a racer, uh, BMX bikes converted. And I just remember the truth, I had a truth in Canada that day that God said, if you honor me with the tithi, I'm gonna open the windows of heaven. And it was gonna delay the effects of the financial mafia that was trying to come around my life to try and rob and kill and destroy me. And I remember the next day I put 10 cents. Do you remember the days of church where you had this like velvet bag going along? I said, what goes on with that? Like, this is like there's a truck door in there, you put hand in there. I know in some other churches, some people would put you know, a $50 note in and then take a $20 out. I'm thinking, it's, it's just like this. This was before ATM machines were there. I'm thinking, I'm loving coming to church. And it can happen and it probably will. And I put, put, I put the 10 cents in. And when I came home from church, 
There's a note in the letterbox and it's from an 18 year old neighbour, five, six houses down the road, Russell. He turned 18, just got himself a car. I said, mate, I just noticed, I've got this old bike I don't need anymore. I want to give it to you. Just got to fix up the back wheel. I remember as I was pushing that bike home, I was so happy, it was just the bike that I wanted. It was just absolutely amazing. And my mum and her wisdom and discernment, parents don't miss these moments with the children. Mum said to me, Andrew, how much money did you put into the offering? I said, Mum, I put my first tithy, I put my first 10 cents in. She goes, how much do you reckon that bike's worth? I said, Mum, it's going to be worth at least $300, $350. She went, the Bible says, Andrew, press down, shaken together, running out of ladder. At that moment, God's truth hit me and I experienced a wonderful sense of his presence, love and kindness and tithing has never become an issue for me after that. It's a wonderful thought. My brothers were so envious of the bike that I just got that they got on the, what this fight, this kingdom financial investment strategy you got yourself in Andrew at the age of 14. I remember starting hanging around church. Blokes, if you know blokes and not to cut the ladies out, sometimes blokes come up to each other and give each other a sneaky handshake, and in it is a crumpled up $50 note. I begin to think this man economy going on in the house of God, the church. They say like this, here's 50 bucks, take your beautiful wife out for a date night this week. I began to experience as a young man, generosity and wisdom from other men. No one, other men were saying to me, your marriage is important in this church, mate. You're, they were investing money in a young man because they wanted a strong community of faith. Mm-hmm. And then I began the practice of crumpled up 50 bucks and pay that forward to other guys. It's not taxable. No one from the Australian Taxation Office here is that. It's a gift. It's a gift. <laughs> Section 57A, whatever it is. It's a gift. And I began to understand this other economy. I remember at the age of 22, we're leading a ministry with troubled young people. And I had three RX2 cars at the time. My RX2 was the fastest thing going around Brisbane at the time. Don't brag, Andrew. I won't tell you how I went. But I remember reading uh, Proverbs 3 one morning in the morning. It says, honour the Lord with your possessions. The word of God hit me and I thought, I have to sell that car and buy myself a minibus. My whole identity uh, around Brisbane and the car market was known around that car. I remember that time saying, God, I want you to... God was saying to me, Andrew, I want you to lay down something of yours that is the most precious possession you have for kingdom purpose. I love driving that beat up Mazda uh, Toyota Hiace bus around. The next 18 months, we interacted with 83 different young people. I baptized over 50 people, and I began to learn something to invest in the kingdom of God. Because of all my roles in accounting and not for profit leaders and stuff, I think we count, I've had 24 or 25 brand new cars in that time thinking, God, the favour of God. I just didn't realise at the time I'm moving along this continuum as God is trying to teach me. And I'm trying to get blessing to you. I'm trying to get increasing influence to you. I want to advance my kingdom through you. I remember the age of 30, um, having done accounting, first person from my family to do higher education. I had a dream to set up my own accounting practice. And I remember the age of 30, God, I was doing Bible college on a Monday night, bits and pieces here and there. But I felt strongly God said, Andrew, I want you to lay down your accounting career. I want you to go to Bible college for three years. I remember that time I was so excited, but I was so devastated. Because at the age of 30, everything I'd worked for, everything I'd worked to get myself out of the poor financial position that my family had been raised in, my whole income, my identity and my influence was tied up in being known as an accountant. Andrew Staggs is doing well for himself. God said to me in the book of John Andrew, unless a seed of ground, grain falls to the ground and dies, you will not bear much fruit. But I remember giving that up and literally having to rebuild my identity and, and just watch the power of God come and literally my influence in my life and look at my resume and the experience of God now in my life just is absolutely amazing as God has taken along strategic nudges along the way. We're at Bible college, ministry college. Literally don't have a lot of money, but it was one of the most prosperous financial stories of our life. I had an insurance policy at the time. When I bought that RX2 car, my father was very angry at me. He said, that car's going to kill your son. He made an appointment for an AMP insurance representative to come around my house. I had to buy an insurance policy, $17 a month. He said, I have got no money, Andrew, to bury you when you kill yourself in that car. (laughs) 
Ding. Thank you, Dad. He's obviously understand stewardship, didn't he? <laughs> While I'm at Bible College, AMP changed its legal structure. They bought out all insurance policies, gave people shares. I sold the shares in the middle of Bible College, basically no money. Twelve thousand dollars just popped wow. out of the sky. I begin to think, ah, oh, God's kingdom, His economy, His way of stewardship, kingdom finance is a whole different different level. I remember then getting a good job and moving in new dimensions of wealth and God challenged me, Andrew, I want you to give somebody a thousand dollars. And me arguing, oh, that person doesn't deserve a thousand dollars. They haven't got the principles of stewardship. Why would I be putting the bad so I'm going to keep that money in the bank again? But just listening to my Spotify worship playlist as I'm driving in the city, I remember coming back over at Kang over the story bridge at Kangaroo Point on a Saturday afternoon. I can still remember the sun coming through. Worshipping some, just praising God, I love you so much. My allegiance is for you. I go, okay, shut up and take my money. <laughs> but I realised that it wasn't my money, it was his money. He's just yeah. saying, Andrew, I want you to move it out of one bank account into another. Our movement turns 50 years this year, and we're so thankful for the faith and the leadership of Pastor Clark Taylor. I got a chance to interview him in February for some doctoral studies I'm doing at the moment. He tells me the story. There are only a couple of weeks of the COC movement and he could see the favour of God, numbers increasing. He felt to go and look to buy a building that would be a permanent home. And he found the old Salvation Army Hall at Woolongabba. He's just negotiating with the real estate agent. He doesn't know what overcome him, but he felt now he discerns as a word of knowledge. He said, I will offer you $35,000 for cash 30 days. Now, $35,000 back in the mid-70s was a lot of money. He turns up at church the next Sunday. Guys, I've got some exciting news. You should be thankful to have a pastor like me. I went and bought us a church this week. Right? Just so happens to be $35,000 cash 30 days. If you feel in any coin generous, be a good steward, be a in this. Well, let's see what God wants to do in our midst. So if you know Pastor Clark Taylor, that's how he talks. He's very kind. Yes, I see Jesus there. And Money is due to be uh, uh, to be paid. A man turns up at the church office in the morning. Pastor Clark, how we go? We got the thirty-five thousand. No, mate, we're nine thousand dollars short. What are we going to do? It's all right. God said He would provide. After lunch, the man turned up at the church office again, and he said, Pastor Clark, have we got the nine thousand dollars yet? No, we haven't got yet, but God will provide. He comes back later in the afternoon. Pastor Clark's packing up to go to the bank to pay the money. Pastor Clark, have we got the money yet? Have we got the $9,000? No, we haven't yet. God, God said he would provide. And the guy goes, Aah! God woke me up this morning at 4 a.m. And he told me I was to come and see you today. And whatever the shortfall was for the pledge, my wife and I were supposed to pay for it. And Pastor Clark said, I told you that God would provide. And they both went off to the bank together. It's a wonderful sense that as we move along the continuum of maturity or opportunity, God brings great grace into our lives. Um, my wife and I, I got a coaching and consulting thing going on the side in the non-for-profit space, and there was a few years back, um, God had just gifted me with some high net worth clients, and I had some money, and I just tucked it aside in a savings account, being a good steward. And I had $10,000 just sitting there. And I had this, oh, you know, I'll just be honest, this is how it works. In 2 Corinthians 9, the Bible says he gives seed to the sower and bread for eating. I love eating bread. <laughs> so I, I was quite proud of ourselves that we'd sort of just tucked that tent and we thought, we're going to watch that grow for something else. And I just thought, had this sneaking thought, I wonder if that's going to be a seed for something. And I thought, that's a thought of the devil. <laughs> it was there. Anyway, I thought nothing of it. Anyway, Jeanne and I were at a C3 um, presence conference. And, I, and it's great. We're down there in Sydney. And then at night time, the guy, a guy gets up and starts talking about the generosity moment. And a season in their church is going on. It's John Pierce. He goes up and says, I remember the first time God challenged me to sow a $10,000 seed above and beyond into his kingdom. <laughs> I just went white. Like, I'm thinking, you can't touch my money. Yeah, like, that's good. I'm a, being a good steward. And I wrestled with it. I hardly slept that night. I managed to get to sleep. Didn't think anything about it. We go into the afternoon session. 
And um, it's their annual like legacy moment, what you're about to go through. And I'd forgotten when they go, okay, it's time to bring our pledges and time to bring our gifts. And my heart just missed a beat. And I turned over to Jean and said, baby, baby, I- I'm sorry. I'm not going to hijack you here, but you know that lazy 10K we've had sitting over there on that extra account? Aren't we good stewards? Look, I think God spoke to me a long time ago about, see, now look, I don't want to chuck in anything. How about we pray? In a way, let's just pray that this feeling goes away and we'll just leave it. So I just said, and she goes, let's pray about it. So I, I, held, I held her hand, said, we pray, and we just pray. God, just give us wisdom on what to do. We're so thankful, blah, blah, blah. And then Jean looks at me and says, amen. Jean looks at me and goes, let's go for it, Andy. Let's go for it. And I remember just going, oh, okay. <laughs> like, accountants are known to have short hands and long pockets. They wouldn't shout if a shark bit them, you know? Like, but I remember faith came into me. My wife and I, we were in agreement about an amount. And my pastor always says, when there's two amounts to give to a pledge, the lower number's always of the devil. <laughs> now, pastors always say that. I thought maybe we could get away with something. But I just remember thinking, faith filled my whole body. And as husband and wife, we came in agreement, wrote it out and, and took it down the front. And on the back, we, we named our seed. And we wrote down, yeah. and, and we, we, we were taught this practice, every time you sow something in the direction of the Holy Spirit and God, you can believe for a harvest, 30, 60, 100-fold return. Yeah. And we've always named our seeds. In my knapsack, I've got a folder of seeds we've named. And we, we prayed for finances. We prayed for the salvation of our children. We've got specific prayers about future marriage partners for our children. Because we don't want to leave our life to chance. We always want to partner with the grace of God. So we named some things then. And, and we prayed. We wanted to get into a home. And we wanted, I wrote down, I want an equity accelerator and I want a cash flow accelerator. And uh, a series of miracles, it, that, that seed set off a chain reaction. And now, sometime later, our whole life is significantly different to what it was before we did that. It was a sovereign moment directed by God to lead us, not to be part of some fundraising activity, but some sort of faith raising because God was wanting to get blessing to us. It makes us vulnerable, my wife and I, to tell that story. Um, but we want to share our journey to inspire you. And we don't want to say that to impress you, but to impress upon you. There are strategic seasons and opportunities that come into a life of a church. It's not about the money, friends, but it's everything about the money. Because God is testing our allegiance because he wants to take us to another place of blessing and favour. The wonder and the power of God is magnificent as he leads us in this area. We're only in a church four weeks ago. I was asked to come in and help lead a similar campaign like this. It was a beautiful couple. They own their own business. They tell the story afterwards. They'd come to that meeting uh, with a particular amount of money to invest in the kingdom of God, part of their annual legacy. And they realized that they had taken a stewardship position. And then after listening to the message and hearing the presentation, they moved to a position of faith and generosity. And the wife said to the husband, we need to double our pledge today. There's blessing and favour available for us today. So what I'd love us to do is it says in Isaiah 1, the Bible says this. God talks to his people and says, come, let us reason together. Come and let's have a chat. You're in a season where God wants to talk to you. He, he wants to negotiate with you. He wants to talk, look at the level of maturity you're at, your level of discipleship, your level of opportunity. And he's gently nudging you. He says, you've been great stewards. Would you move now to a dimension of faith and generosity, not only to unlock something financial precision in here, but I'm with Pastor John. Giving is a way to dominate the spiritual atmosphere over your home. I know this, unsurrendered money in your life, the devil can come in and take it and devour it. Money that's holy, money that's devoted to God in good stewardship and with faith puts you in the dimension for exponential fulfillment, satisfaction, breakthrough opportunities, and from time to time, financial blessing. So... 
what might your next step be? I know this. The Bible says in Luke 6, that the measure that you give is the measure that's used to return back to you. My wife and I have been praying over this season for you as a church that this will be a sovereign season. You'll see this as an opportunity. It's a roller coaster. You're locked in. You've got to come back next week. You can't wag church from now on. You can't wag the Sunday where it comes time to bring your offerings. But many of you right now will wake up, go to bed on the Saturday night, and you will not be able to wait till church comes the next morning because you want to bring a gift, a seed, that some of you, I believe, are looking this morning for a key that's going to unlock generational blessing and advantage to your family, friends. I'm proposing this is part of this opportunity. I've seen in my life, my wife and I have seen in our lives, the blessing and the favour of God as we're led through strategic opportunities. We better pray, eh? Let's stand, eh? We better pray. God, you've been good to us this morning. Come, let us reason together. Oh, God, we better land this plane. (laughs) Good ways of prayer. I've crafted a prayer up at the screen. Some of you may want to have a look at this. You might want to take a photo of this. Yeah, what the heck did I pray? What did I come into agreement with? So I'm going to pray and you can mumble along or if you want to just put your hands out in front and say, God, I'm ready to receive your wisdom and faith. Some of you might say, God, just I've got faith, but help me with my faith. I love this church, but I'm starting to enjoy the uncomfortableness of this season because God, I realise you're trying to get good things to me because you're a good, good father. So God, thank you, God, for your love. I love this verse, out of, this is out of Psalm 104. Yahweh, you are my soul's celebration. How could I ever forget the miracles of kindness you've done for me? You kiss my heart with forgiveness in spite of all I've done. You've healed me inside and out from every disease. I realise today afresh that I'm a steward. I submit to you, Lord God Almighty. I'm strengthening my allegiance to you today. I affirm your ownership of me in every aspect of my life. I declare that my resources, my time, my talent, my treasure, my body, my sexuality are actually yours. I recognise that you, God, are the owner of everything and I am a steward, a manager for the resources you've entrusted to me. Recognising that heaven is my home and Christ is my Lord, I commit myself to seek your guidance and to do as you direct with your resources. Increase my faith, please. I want to please you in faith and with generosity this morning. Amen and amen. God bless you all.